Hello. In this video, I want to continue addressing some of the claims made by Wim Winters about double bead theory. I usually say that people who are already convinced don't need to watch this, as I'm only repeating what is written in the comment section of Wim's videos. However, these comments, or many of these comments, have now been deleted. And I also raise points here that, to my knowledge, have not been previously addressed, so it might just be worth your while. I want to start by addressing a short video he once made. The subject was a trill in the first Chopin Impromptu. People familiar with his channel will know exactly the video I'm talking about. The editor of the particular score targeted by Wim was Hans van Bülow, who was a major figure of the second half of the 19th century. Bülow had given, arbitrarily, as Chopin had by then renounced putting metronome marking on his music, the indication of 132 for the quartet, or quarter note, which is perfectly reasonable, even on the slowish side of things. Let me show you. Give something like which if we double beat it gives you the rather slow speed. When we come to the second section, the double beat sounds like which you might admit um, sounds a little slow for Anelogro as I quasi presto. But then Bülow also requested or suggested that the trills should be played with 16 notes for a half note. Wim duly noted that this, at the tempo given by Bülow, was impossible. Now, Wim often make claims that things are impossible when they actually are completely possible. He has clearly never trained himself to play fast because he thinks nobody ever wrote music to be played fast. So he sometimes completely misjudges the actual playability of a piece. But in this case, he is right. Eight demi semiquavers at the pace of 132 is probably impossible. However, I still consider his arguments a fallacy. So why is this? Well, there are two things to consider. For one, Chopin writes at the beginning of the F minor section, the one we are concerned with, sostenuto. Sostenuto is a slightly ambiguous marking which can mean more than one thing. But more often than not, more often than not, it does refer to a slower tempo. This means that the tempo here is a different one, and indeed this is how this piece is always played. But nevertheless, even allowing for a reasonable slacking of tempo, the trill still remains pretty much out of reach for most people, and if they might just be about playable, cramming so many notes uh, in would make it sound rather like an unpleasant alarm clock. So what? Here I will read to you the following extract from a paper called The Musical World, called Dr. van Bülow, on the value of the metronome. Dr. von Bülow agreed with Beethoven and Weber, who have left it on record that the metronome was useless after the first two bars of any subject. Weber, on the first production of his Oriante, declared that after the tempo was given, leading off the subject, he could not be trammeled in his expression of the music, at the various effects to be given. 
in all which remarks Dr. von Bülow agreed. There are quite a few texts like this. They tell us something important. Most composers, at least from Beethoven onward, did not intend their music to be played rigidly from beginning to the end. The trill in question happens at a moment where everything in the music, the crescendo, the spread chords on the left hand, the increased intensity points toward a great sense of freedom and no one, however many notes they are putting it, would think of playing it in time. It sounds a bit, at least, no one but Wim Winters. So... <laughs> Something like this. I would also like to quote the following text from Mushless, who says it very clearly. The musical world knows that marking the time by a metronome is but a slight guide for performers and conductors. Its object is to show the general time of a movement, particularly at its commencement. But it is not to be followed strictly throughout, for no piece except a march or a dance would have any real life and expression or light and shade if the solo performer or the orchestra under its conductor were strictly to adhere to one and same tempo without regard to the many marks which commands its variations. The player or conductor who enters into the time and spirit of the piece must feel when and where he has to introduce the necessary changes. And these are often of so delicate nature that the marks of the metronome would become super abundant, not to say impossible. However, if I take Wim at his own game, then we can take another example of trails from Bülow editions. He edited the Beethoven Sonata and very often writes his trill in full notes. We can take, sorry, that's my dog. We can take the Waldstein last movement. Bülow writes 108 for the tempo of the finale. Again, I'll play it to you. In single beat. Now, when you come with this section with a rhythm trill, then if you follow below in double beat, you get something like this. And so on. How Incredible is this. So, as usual, Wim's argument about Bülow marking his speed in double beat is reduced to nothing. First, because he didn't start with the right premises, stylistically. Secondly, because he never bothered to check if his ideas would still be valid in another context. But more, more importantly, this reveals one think, which is that Wim tends to get things wrong because he makes assumptions on 19th century practice, which are completely, utterly at odds with what the sources of the time tell us about it. He used a very similar argument to say that the Chopin waltz in A flats major, the marking had to be double beat because one could not do the flourishes. Uh, <laughs> in time. And um, again, he selected his sources carefully, keeping the one saying that Chopin used to play a free right hand on a free left hand, on a completely dead still left hand. But he left out all the ones which 
though he knew perfectly, he did not find convenient to use at this moment, namely Liszt, who said that there were two uses of rubato in Chopin, the one described above, and another one where actually both hands were moving in time. He could also have quoted Berlioz, who thought Chopin sometimes went too far in rhythmic distortions. And he could also have remarked that Chopin's style is largely inherited from Italian opera, where this kind of cadenza is frequent and where the orchestra has to wait for the singer to deliver his line in a way which is anything but strict. He is guilty of intellectual dishonesty because he knows all the sources, but he preferred to say only what seemed to prove his case. The fact is that Wim has a view of history and performance practice firmly anchored in the 18th century, in Bach in particular. He presents us with a re revised view of music history in which one can trace an unbroken line of tradition going right through nearly 200 years of music making from Bach to Mozart and Haydn, Beethoven, Chopin and beyond. In doing so, he ignores in a way which is frankly bewildering that this period saw actually vast changes in styles and in the very meaning of music. It is true that all the composers above recognized a tradition and an inheritance, but it is also true to say that in many ways, each of them has revolutionized the musical world of their predecessors. The texts again are perfectly clear on this. By playing all these composers with exactly the same approach, the same style, the same range of tempi, Wim's Rim robs them of what made each of them unique. In his interpretations, all of them sound almost an interchangeable, which is to say all of them sounds as though he's playing Bach. He would have been inspired to read what Czerny has to say in his Opus 500 about the need to adapt one style to each composer and his very precise description of what each of these styles entailed. He also makes a further historical mistake in thinking that Czerny knew much about Bach's style. One has to remember that the concept of historically informed performance is very much a 20th century invention. People before then didn't care about this because unlike us, they lived musically in their own time. That is to say, they played first and foremost the music written by their contemporaries which is today by and large no longer true. I have a collection of letters by the composer Roger Ducasse, whom I am interested in. Roger Ducasse died as late as 1954. In one of them, he talked about hearing the Matthew Passion conducted by Mengelberg. He talks about the extraordinary experience it was to hear this music but at no moment he, he mentions the style of the performance, which today would be unthinkable. If you have ever heard Mengelberg's interpretation of the Passion, you will know what I'm talking about. You may love it or hate it, but you will immediately talk about the fact that it is stylistically absolutely bizarre. For Roger Ducasse, this was so much not an issue that he didn't even think of mentioning it. And of course, he wouldn't have known the concept of stylistically co correct performance of a work written 2,200 years ago, sorry, was simply meaningless for him. To go back to Czerny, he may have once read C.P.E. Bach's Art of Keyboard Playing, but that does not mean that he knew much about how to play Bach in a st stylistically accurate fashion. Why would he? He belonged to an other era of music, one which had very different aims, and one would just have to look at his edition of the Well-Tempered Clavier to realize this. He knows that the Allegro was somewhat slower as an, at, at the time of Bach, but he clearly doesn't have a clue how much slower. Anybody who uses today's edition uses it to know how Bach was perceived at the time of Beethoven 
but not as a mean to understand how Bach music should be played in itself. Yet Wim uses his edition as a proof that Czerny is just in line with the tradition, also ignoring the innumerable problems presented there by double beat tempi, particularly in slow movement. So his error in reasoning is a historical one, and the double beat theory is not the cause, but the consequence of this. The real puzzle here is that although he is perfectly happy to maintain a perfect university of uniformity of style from roughly 1650 to 1850, a period which has seen the change from Baroque to classical to romantic music, he sees no problem in putting an abrupt, sudden and profound change in style where suddenly a whole generation of pianists or musicians who were taught by composers themselves, decided to play everything twice as fast as the composer intended, and this at a time where actually the style underwent no significant change at all. Romanticism was a very stable style right to the end of the 19th century. Of course, this bizarre speeding up for no good reason is the only way he can deal with the wealth of historical recording, made by people who heard or worked with Chopin, Liszt, Schumann, and which are on the whole surprisingly fast to our ear. This is all for today. I had intended a very short video and got carried away in writing this as often. If you found it interesting in any way, the best thing you could do is to post it on a video in the Authentic Sound channel. Of course, by doing this, you take the risk of being banned from commenting ever again. But these videos, when they manage to reach out, can sometimes make people think a little more deeply about the things which are said on his channel. And this is the only reason I keep making them. Thanks for watching. Thank you.